Okay, guys, uh, just just before we start the streaming, uh, the aircon here tends to get switched off at like 5.30 maybe today, they could have uh, uh, extended it to 6, right? So it, it will get a bit warm, but I hope your questions will be even hotter and the conversation even more, you no know, sizzling, okay? And that's what we're all here for, for sharing. And uh, there's, uh, there's drinks there, I mean, you've got the coffee machine at the corner, and there's some three in one from courtesy of tea, and the hot water is also in the corner, okay? There's uh, just minimal of snacks here, okay? Some, some curry pal and uh, the traditional bihon, and there's the cups and plates. Try to use the same cup again, okay? Because we don't have that many cups. And, uh, so we're, we're probably going to start soon as soon as uh, the cake is ready. Okay, no, no, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so if we can, uh, I, I may not sit, so it's fine. Hey, Bikish, what if I subconsciously stand up? Is that a big deal? Then we're just zooming at your crotch. <laughs> <laughs> we can't have that. I'll set up some. Everybody's in here. That's a sanitizing space here. Gentlemen, could you just look here for a second? Okay. Uh, The latest, uh, latest SLR 40 megapixels disguised as a phone. We're supposed to do that. You can, however hip you are. I guess before we start, uh, we, we do have a sponsor to thank, and that's obviously IBM. And actually, when you sponsor this event, you get five minutes to, to give your pitch about what your company. We just event started on, on a running start without a commercial. You know, quick qualifier. So thanks very much to IBM, you know, at least for sponsoring the event. Uh, and then I think hopefully next month we'll have more sponsors. But that's not important actually. The more important is for you guys to be here and the sharing that goes on. And I, I was telling the family so, so that the way we have structured it is kind of interesting. Uh, I'll sit down and teach is that it's almost like an unpanel. You know, you've heard of this in the US, they call it conference, right? It's a bit unconventional. So this is also along the same lines. Because those of you who've been for the first few, you realize that it's like, you know, each family speaks for maybe 10 minutes at most, or 15 minutes if they're long-winded. And then the audience comes in with, with their questions, right? So we surely don't pretend that we have all the answers. And, and the guys here want to learn from the questions that you ask also. So please don't just keep your mouth shut and not say something. There, there are no silly questions, there's no such thing as a stupid answer, and there's no such thing as a incomprehensible question also, which is my speciality, okay? So just leave that to me. You, you mean you're not supposed to listen, listen, listen? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a shame, man. Okay. Obviously, if you've got somebody with a sharp wit on the panel, so that helps a lot. So you don't just rely on me to be witty. <laughs> That's the end of it. But uh, what happens is that, okay, there's a lot of sharing that goes on, and you want to be brave and, and on and open to be sharing. One of the things that we're trying to do is, uh, somebody uh, who's called uh, Sir Jodha is, uh, actually you're not Malaysian, right? You're from Canada, and he's been here now for two years, and he said when he came to Malaysia, one of the things he realized was that there was very little platform and appeal for people to network and share, and just, you know, people of, people of the like kind, which means entrepreneurs or those who want to get into the tech space, you just have an event and meet and learn from each other. And he, he, he is one, right? But, but the funny thing is that we every month have a different topic that we think is interesting. And it's not, we won't always pick like to get the crowd over. It's not about the size of the crowd. Like I said all the time, it's about the quality of the discussion, the interaction we have. We could have an event dealing systems, and even if there are 20 people here. If the discussion is, is, is interesting, you'll learn something. And because we've got hangout, right, you don't have to come. You can listen to the discussion and you can also gain something from that. <laughs> okay, no, no, we all we wanted to come also, yeah. But if you come in, there's like lucky draws and freebies and all kind of incredible and amazing uh, cuisine food also there, which the camera cannot see, obviously. <laughs> Fantastic company, yeah, all that. But and anyway, it is great that, that Sir and, and his uh, colleague is here. And it's also great that we've got uh, Mr. G, who runs a country called, a uh, company, not a country. <laughs> a company called Centrum Software. 
He's one of the interesting entrepreneurs out there in, in the space, and he's doing things in the contact center space and in healthcare. And he's done work for hospitals around the region, and his team right now is about to fly to South Africa to, to go in, and, and he's being parachuted in to rescue a project. So he's doing a lot of exciting stuff. He's got regional know-how and experience. He's right at the corner there, far end there. So at the, after this event, please go up and say hi to him and get to know him and the rich exposure and experience he has had trying to build a Malaysian company, taking it regional, okay? It's exciting to have him and, and, and serve here. Some of you are here for the first time also, it's great. Just network with each other and just share, okay? That's incredibly important. We cannot overemphasize it enough. And now we'll just quickly get started on the topic, which is really about, you know, uh, mobilize your business model. And the idea is that mobile is, is, obviously we know mobile is important, right? And it's a big trend. But we tend to focus on, on the devices part of it and the end user experience. But in the enterprise space and even as you as entrepreneurs within your business models, are you mobilizing your business you know, in the right way? And for that, that's why we had these guys come up and just share their experiences. And my brief to them was very simple. Just share something in 10 slides and also present it from the point of view that if you are an entrepreneur, right, if you're going out to become an entrepreneur, which of these you know, uh, uh, trends or issues would you adopt in your business? So I don't know what they're going to talk about. It will totally surprise us and hopefully it'll be interesting. And we're going to start with, with Karen first. And not because she's got the least amount of hair on, on you know, in the panel and we're going by how long your hair is. <laughs> but uh, because she's the most senior person here also. And also because she's with a big regional telco, Exiata, and he's doing stuff around the innovation space. And uh, Karen has been a VC before with SoftBank. So those of you who want to have uh, some advice on how to appeal to, to uh, you know, big time VCs, you can approach him. And I first knew him when he was running MaxisNet. I still have his business card that says MaxisNet. And I was told then that he was uh, AK star then. So uh, I don't know what had happened since then, but <laughs> he's now uh, an ex star. But, uh, that tells you what happened. <laughs> that tells you what happened. Very honest of him. And then Naveen is, is, I think, the point person for Frost in the telco space, right? And ICT, yeah? In general. Telco. Telco, telco uh, specifically. Okay, great. And then I, I will actually pass the mic to each of them for a 30 second spiel about themselves, except for uh, uh, Karan. I've already gave you a spiel. So Naveen, maybe you can just share 30 seconds about yourself. And then Nima from McKinsey. And it's great to have somebody from McKinsey out because I think all of you know that these guys are so busy and they build by the, by the tens of thousands per hour, right? So it's great to have him out here and sharing stuff with us also. So I guess uh, uh, Naveen, just a bit about yourself. Thank ah, sorry, you have your mic. Use the old mic, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've got our scale now. We've got four mics, man. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, Karan. Um, I'm very excited to be part of this event. And uh, I'm uh, with Ross and Sullivan and with the ICT team looking at mobile and wireless as a research area for Asia Pacific region. Before that, I was uh, with IDC in India taking care of. Uh, mobile and wireless space again, the telco space could predominantly. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, Nimal, you've got your own mic. Thank you, Nimal. I'm Nimal Manuel. I'm with McKinsey and Company, based in KL for the past uh, 10 12 years. Prior to that, I was a double E. Uh, I used to design uh, radio chipsets, so way up the value chain. Uh, so that's my background. Okay. Oh, you've been with them for that long, right? In KL. Very You're Malaysian, right? Because when you get the name, <laughs> The name kind of throws you off, right? Okay, great. So now, uh, Karan, you've got the, the floor. There will be 10 slides. I'll be counting. Okay. <laughs> listen. Oh, uh, <laughs> listen, yeah. Hey, by the way, our stylist, right, as somebody is talking, if you have a question for them right away, if you don't agree with anything they say, please put up your hand and, and post the question to them, okay? We are definitely not going to finish talking and then only we open up the questions, right? The questions happen right away, spontaneous, okay? Right? I'll just obstruct the other guy. I'm just trying to move a little bit to the composite. So for the presentation duration. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry. Is that good? That's good. Okay. Alright, we all like it. I'm going to adopt the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, approach to innovation. Right? And be the first to admit that, uh, you know, as telcos, and you know, we have this pride of place in the technology chain. But you know, I'll be the first to admit that uh, right now we are a telecom species in a software age. And um, you know, I'd like to say that because I think the same holds true for a lot of you who are in traditional businesses, 
um, and I was struggling to think about you know how do I mobilize? What what is you know what does the next generation of the internet mean for me? And uh, believe you me that us in the telcos we are suffering the same uh, same kind of uh, questions and, and dilemmas as you do. You know, as Karam alluded to, you know, I'm kind of long into tooth in, in this industry, and then in 2000, Maxis, uh, when we're talking about, you know, what does the internet mean? Um, you know, the typical answer is we need to get to build a website. And so in 2000, you know, almost 13 years ago, the answer about what was the internet was we need to build a good website. And about four or five years later, you know, after spending millions of dollars of McKinsey to tell you how to build a website, <laughs> we finally come up and you know say, you know, is Cellcom Asiata DG technology company? Do you have an online uh, online strategy? And and the answer is yes, we have a website. <laughs> and I think the the question really, you know, as we go on to the next five years. Talking about, do you have an online strategy? Um, and you know, for you in a brick and mortar business, do we need to be online? Do we have an online business? I'll give you a hint. The answer is not. Let's build a website. Right? And you will be amazed at the number of people in well-regarded companies who think that the internet is all about building a better website. And you know, I, I'm going to illustrate this with some vignettes, right? In a telco, we have a huge identity crisis about what we want to be. Right? Um, you know, we're, we're making a lot of money, but you know, we have people like Skype and WhatsApp, etc., really sounding the death knell, right? Uh, you have people talking about e-commerce and m-commerce and etc., and then we go off saying, "Let's be a bank. Let's be a let's start with Astro and." Distribute dongles and become a video display player. But all of these beg the question: What does it mean? What does it mean to really put your business into the internet? And again, right? <laughs> <laughs> just to show that I took it seriously. Right? <laughs> and he told me last night we need ten slides. <laughs> so you know, again, I'd like to share with you just you know maybe. A few examples of, of what we have learned over the last two or three years about getting online or being digital and why it isn't about being building a better website. Right? You would have heard about web services and then this whole jargon about uh, getting APIs and getting developers. Uh, one thing we learned in, in Asiata and in Southcom is don't assume that developers really want to work with you. <laughs> How is that? It sounds really funny. It, it sounds really funny. In fact, I was in Palo Alto and uh, you know, I was having dinner and I started giving the spiel. We have 220 million dollars. The guy says, you guys are a joke. Sintel is a bigger joke. We don't need you. We don't want you. <laughs> so, you know, how is that for eating humble pie? You know, there's this film, you know, film field of dreams where Kevin Costner gets this, this impression that you know, build this baseball park and people will come and, and watch it. Right? And, and sometimes that's our approach to getting our business online, which is let's build it and they will come. Right? For those of you who have been in this, you've heard this numerous times. That don't think that people, just because you have an online website or you've hired a few you know, earring guys, that means that you're digital. Nothing against earring guys, but... <laughs> In our case, our APIs. Right? We, build, we spent lots of money building APIs into our network and having uh, you know developers come in and say, hey, you know, you want to send an SMS from Facebook into your into your uh, mobile phone? We can do it. We can build this. You can you know buy online buy credit on your Facebook, etc. The reality is, once we built it, we really had to learn how to market it. Now, if you're an online business. And you know you built an API that you think an app can you can use. You need to learn how to market the software, right? and it is a whole lot of work. We had to build an entire new division learning how to market API. 
Right? So, you know, over the last two years, we've trained over 500 developers, and the sum total of applications we have is two. So, you know, what kind of training is that? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's yeah. two came from the ones we did for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a company called I Train. But again, don't underestimate the effort you would need to get people to understand what you're trying to do. Second is don't pretend this isn't real software. You know, don't don't read the jargon saying that everything's out of a box and you click a few boxes here and there and uh, you're up and running and you're web 2.0 or whatever. This is actually really hard work. Um, you know, we had discussions saying you know, we don't want to be a software company, we're a telco company. And you probably have the same discussion. This is not our core competence. Uh, we're not a software company. You know, we are Stop or whatever. Don't pretend you don't need some real hardcore software expertise, right? Because you know, for those of you who've been in a software company, documenting, versioning, giving samples, training people is a lot of work. Don't us don't underestimate the effort that's required. If you aren't willing to spend hiring those resources, um, you know, either organically or with partners, you're in for trouble. Don't assume that you'll get it right. You know, you'll probably get it wrong. We spent five years and you know we've got about half of it kind of right, and the other half completely wrong. Right? Uh, so this is a business where the reality is no one knows the right answers. Right? And you hire you know you hire five different consultants and they'll give you five different answers. And you know it's not to say any of them are wrong. It's just the nature of the piece. It's an extremely detailed, fast-moving business. You're not going to get things right. So if you hire people who implement things for you and they get it wrong, that's part of doing business. I guess the only advice we can give you is start small. Don't spend $20 million on a McKinsey study. BCG or a BCG. If you can give it $100,000 to you know, a smaller company to probably get the same, effort, same level of uh, uh, wrongness. <laughs> hey, you sound like you wanted to be a consultant in your previous life. <laughs> and, and regretted you were not. <laughs> Don't start slinging in sales now. <laughs> Don't try to fit everything in. You can't do everything at once. Start small. Right? Keep it simple. Right? Um, again, for, for the techno geeks among you, REST, XML. Don't do anything beyond that. Right? Because it's just too complicated and it's probably wrong. Right? Don't build anything you can't afford to throw away. Right? Um, you know, this is probably for, for the bigger companies among you, uh, right? particularly telcos. Right? We tend to be standards bigots. Right? If it isn't open, uh, you know, GSMA compliant, we don't want to do it. It doesn't mean a toss. The reality is you know, all these standards bodies are just looking for a way to get some consulting money. Mm. You know, the bodies also are, you would think that the entire industry will follow GSMA or it's for interoperability and all that jazz. The reality is oh. people will follow what works. But, you know, standards are good, but don't be a bigger. Right? There's really a confluence between something that's ready to be used, whether you can understand what it's all about, and whether you, know, whether you can afford to throw it away. Oh, is it? Okay. I thought you had a question. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, is that fine now? And, and this is actually slaying some, you know, secret cows in, in, in the industry, right? Because particularly in regulated industries, uh, you know, we fall behind the wall of let's be standards compliant. Right? The reality is, you know, Whatever works, whatever scale, whatever you know gets to you know, gets to uh, gets to market first probably becomes the standard. Or oh, whatever is the market first and gets success. Okay, ah, get success. Yeah. Um, one of our big learnings is you know we tended to leave the what we call the pretty art, the, the user experience, the user interface, to agencies, and we forgot the fact that. It's actually 90% of the success of your product is in the user experience of the, um, the UX, the UI design. 
really spend time understanding creativity, right? design, wow. art, basic aesthetics, um, because they are going to contribute to your success more than you know the tech, technological uh, bells and whistles that you have behind your product. Really spent a lot of time. We spent you know quite a lot of time building a UX practice because we realized that by giving it to an agency, we lost control of how we could interact with our customers and in fact control of our entire product. When did you realize this? And, and too late. Get on yourself. Too late. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, this is probably two years ago. We set up a UX. There's lots of funky things. That is within Southcom or within Exia Talent? Within Southcom. Southcom, yeah, two years ago. But, um, but the reality, particularly if you're starting to build apps, right? Um, you know, how do, how do you buy apps or how does your kid buy apps? They look at the pretty picture in front. Right? So you might as well spend some time figuring out how to make that app look good right? when, they, when they click on it. At least have some design sense. Um, right? And don't be afraid to take on the big boys. Um, this is, uh, you know, a space where you can't be the juggle couple. You know, the reality of the internet is that, uh, you know, we, you know, Facebook and you know, all the big brands are here. We launched uh, our own SMS-based social network called Colony, which is targeted at the Bosia and Macron bit of the uh, of the world. And we have four million active social media uh, users on it, so it can be done. Um, right. So oh, that's my bad written analogy, but yeah. <laughs> I'll skip that. Ten minutes, ten slides. Okay, done. Okay, done. great. Thanks a lot. Uh, we'll come back to some of the things that, that you raised, right, uh, Karan. Uh, we'll, we'll go with Naveen first and and see what he has got to say about what he thinks is, is interesting in this space and what he personally would use if he ended up becoming a rocker. You haven't answered that, but I'll come back to you last. If you were to start a company, you're going to do something in the space. What mobile strategy would you execute on? Okay. Yeah. I don't have any slides to uh, share, and um, what I'm going to share you with is that um, some of my experiences uh, over the last decade, what I've seen, or uh, what mobile has done for uh, individuals, and you know, till what extent. Now, every board uh, room that we talk about mobile is part of their talk or part of their strategy. So. Um, okay, so when uh, you know when when we used to have no voice communication, and then the era of mobile communication came in, and then we started using mobile phone, and from there we started uh, with basic simple SMS, and now we see everywhere around the world we are talking about mobile internet, and you know those kind of things are happening. So um, as we have grown o over these years, we have seen uh, you know people started using this these applications and then um, n n now uh, mobile internet and the data that we talk about is uh, it is happening around around all of us and it's it's not uh, true uh, to say that uh, uh, mobile is uh, you know impacting or kind of having a larger impact on a developed part of the world as compared to uh, grow, growing economies like malaysia or or let's say india and uh, you know, when it comes to uh, using mobile phone for your business, uh, mobilizing your business or your business application, so people have earlier used to say that, okay, what can I do? I can reach to a customer and talk to him and figure it out whether he needs some application or some service or not. Then they started uh, saying, okay, now can I create an application? Now the time has come when you are actually putting, uh, building that application and giving it in the hands of consumers to say that, okay, here is mobile internet. Here are the applications, and go and use it. We, we um, uh, you know, talked about WhatsApp and uh, this kind of an application. Now these are being used and downloaded by millions and millions of people on mobile phones. And they, these applications came in from you know uh, companies who such applications came in from companies who had you know very small companies or startups. We have examples uh, you know around the world which. Um, applications disrupted the uh, biggies. Um, Karan said that don't be afraid of uh, taking head on with the, some of the larger companies in this new era. And we have those examples. For example, Cisco uh, got disrupted with WebEx, and later on they had to acquire to remain in business. You know, and today, uh, you know, 
small small uh, for example uh, rovio created those as an angry bird as a game and now we see the kind of success they are enjoying so point is we need to have i mean everybody say that you go to create something very simple you go to create i mean it's very easy to say but when it comes to implementation i think that's a that's a area where people uh, you know tend to uh, miss the miss the call so uh, created you know very small applications we need not to have a large um, an application which serves maybe most of the people we need to have very simple which attracts a uh, limited amount of people and we will see the success and we have some of the examples in the world and uh, you know what happens when large companies where do they falter they they falter when they say okay um, these are the big uh, companies or big clients that i can target to they may need x uh, feature also so let me put that in so every time they cr- try to create and put so many applications so many features in their product and their product becomes very expensive as well as very difficult to manage and that's why new companies or, or companies who have that very small need is not able to either buy it and the big companies say okay uh, they are not our target market is they are not profitable so let me just leave it uh, there only and they don't target so thereby the other companies who are very niche there and telcos uh, such big telcos are having a threat from all the ott guys um, like uh, whatsapp so sms revenues you look at anywhere in the world is is going down and uh, whatsapp is is the reason for it you know correct me if i'm wrong current so and other uh, big trend that i see in the market is about social networking <coughs> social networking uh, more than 500 million users use mobile phone uh, facebook on their mobile phones more than 50% of twitter's usage is on mobile phone so this is one device which can be used very very effectively to reach your customers what we need to have is um, right kind of a mix whether you know from customer segmentation and to fit your kind of product so yeah so that, that's uh, you know my take or uh, my suggestion is that let's have you know very simple thing let's not uh, be afraid of uh, large guys and when you have these things put together i'm sure there would be success behind you thank you and i would be more than happy to take uh, questions and uh, that is the most exciting part of my mind thank you interesting that both that the one common thing both of them have said is that keep it simple which is quite interesting right that create something that's simple i guess so that the market can use it and it becomes you know it can easily also right also keep it simple because guys like the telcos you know keep it simple guys like the telcos are really very intelligent <laughs> seriously okay hey are you sure you're working with a telco <laughs> i can also share an example uh, you know outside this all the big companies that we have seen i mean i don't want to name them but they themselves missed on some of the very very simple trends that you and me and everybody would have been able to understand that and then they realize oh industry has or the market has gone that way so now they have come came back and uh, i don't want to name them but they came back and then started off in those kind of projects so yeah so again there, there's great opportunity for entrepreneurs out there right and yes. don't assume that the telco is doing all right and, and i mean generally uh, uh, startup companies or a small company they think okay big guys have big money they have got people from you know all walks mm-hmm. of life or yeah. you know experts uh, everywhere and they may have i mean they have their own sort of challenges and that's why they miss some of the very basic trends and we have seen those happening in the recent past with some of the very very successful and large companies okay. come which uh, uh, chinese uh, internet company uh, launch wechat uh, is weibo or something Yeah. Ah, Tencent. Look, the story told to me by somebody reliable is that Tencent actually went to see the guys at uh, at WhatsApp in Silicon Valley, and it's a group of like twenty or thirty engineers, and they wanted to buy them out. And the uh, WhatsApp guys gave a, a ridiculous amount, and so these guys from Tencent look and said, "There are only thirty of you, and we're giving you this obscene amount of money." You say no. and they decided okay we'll go back and the money we're going to spend to buy you up we'll build something on our own and we'll throw 300 or heck even 3000 engineers behind it and that's why you have wechat today now which is quite interesting to see where wechat goes right because they were the guys who actually wanted to buy out whatsapp so so interesting let's see where that game plays out but just 
just like a little anecdote from an insider who knew this story. So, okay, uh, Nimo, you have to grab the mic and. and uh, okay, the uh, remote. Okay. Is a free consultancy. I need help. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I thought I'd take a different lens to this. Um, in, in, in McKinsey, we don't. Uh, I, I personally have not had that much experience serving startups. But I had a lot of experience defending against startups on behalf of my clients. Um, and I thought it would be useful. Um, I'm not a technologist, uh, but I, I serve my clients in spaces where they have to come up against uh, other companies who are disrupting their core business model. So I thought it would be useful to share the areas where my clients find themselves to be most on the defensive against guys like yourselves. And uh, where from the outside in, I see credible business models, which I think could scale up quite interestingly. So um, I've got kind of seven areas here. There's one not here which is very important, which I'll come to in a second. But uh, I won't go through in detail most of these, but a couple I think are worth pointing out. So the first one around cloud technology and services, I mean, not surprising, going 30% per year. Uh, it's probably worthwhile, and I won't go in detail to this page, but we've mapped the full kind of uh, value chain Across Sorry, Nima, are you able to share your slides with the audience also then? Um, the I would be happy to. Okay, great. So, uh, so don't take notes, okay? Just listen. <laughs> uh, I'll check some of these. Okay, some of them. Okay. Um, and, and, and it's interesting because uh, if you look across industries and you look across specific parts of the value chain, there are really some very interesting areas where we see a lot of disruption and we see a lot of interesting players going out. Uh, I mean, uh, again, not news to you guys, but uh, I think there's some very interesting business models there. I'll skip big data because, I mean, you all heard about it. But enterprise mobility, I think, is super interesting. Uh, it's not been a focus largely so far. Everyone's been more focused on the consumer side. But if you look at the kinds of propositions which are coming on, so, you know, around communication collaboration, around getting access to ERP and CRM type applications remotely, Around around productivity type applications, um, you know, sales force management, field force management, around M to M, and around leveraging mobile as a channel to the consumer. Increasingly, many of uh, our larger clients are aware and doing something about this. Uh, the telcos are the first point of call in terms of enabling this, but many of the uh, middleware layers, the telcos have not invested in. Uh, many of the service layers, in terms of the uh, you know being able to to uh, uh, advise and 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 recommend uh, a layer you know let me go back a second here we go in terms of the professional services around the business process redesign around the custom application development a lot of that we see the smaller players the more nimble players actually getting a lead there so I think this is a huge opportunity. Uh, it's a natural place for telco to own, but telcos in general have not been as nimble in capturing the space. Uh, I'm very bullish on this area. The other area which I think is quite interesting is around um, <coughs> the internet of M to M, and broadly speaking, machine to machine. We've done a lot of work here. We focus on certain industries, and the value pool at stake here is amazingly high. Uh, I mean, it spans from the very simple RFID type applications for, for, for retail and inventory management, all the way to, uh, you'll be interested to know that the biggest application we see for m 2 m is actually in uh, uh, you know, uh, flow-oriented manufacturing. So, you know, oil and gas, for example, in terms of uh, 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 exploration. There's huge applications there for m 2 m type applications, and it's only starting to come up. So huge opportunity. Next one is around. The only starting meaning, even like startups in, in the West or in, in Japan or Korea are not really in this space. Then. There are many companies in this place, but in terms of the amount of value that has transitioned, I think it's just a start of the escalator. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, uh, one guy 
from Malaysia. I don't know if any of you remember Daryl Gardner. Uh, he used to run a company called Bistone right, Services. And in, in year 2000, he was an uh, uh, economist, did a, a story on, on how Asia, and, uh, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Singapore positioning as an internet hub. And, and they profiled him. He was about to go for a listing that year itself. But he was key launcher in, out of Malaysia, enterprise ERP on the cloud. Back then, it's called software as a service. In 1995, and he said that. Uh, being ahead of the technology curve is obviously a dangerous place to be at. And recently he was at, a, at an event that, that, that I think iTrain organized. And he said that technologies that introduced uh, take 30 years to mature, you know. So like the interest is really like what, uh, 14, 15 years, right? So there's still so much innovation and opportunities through there, right? Like as you were saying in this, uh, this role for inner you know, enterprise space. It's very interesting. I just wanted to bring that up to you because there's really a lot of opportunity there. I don't think the guys out of in Japan or in the US or Europe, right, have an edge over us. They don't. Uh, we all have the same number of trillion of gray cells up here. And I think we'll do well. Um, okay, uh, which, which, the, the next one, just worth mentioning, I think, is enterprise social networking. You know, a lot of you all have talked today about uh, consumer-oriented social networking. Enterprise-oriented social networking is a white space. And many companies are starting to look at it in terms of uh, how they think about product development internally. And this is not about, I mean, everyone's seen the Lego examples about, uh, you know, uh, crowdsourcing. This is within an enterprise, how you leverage social networks to get the best out of your organization. So there's applications around product development, there's applications around cooperations. So simple things like forecasting, forecasting trends, very important for large organizations. How you leverage social networking to do that well. Uh, marketing and sales, uh, customer service. So again, right, uh, I guess, if you take a step back, if you take a step away from the consumer, the enterprise is a huge white space waiting to be plugged. But wouldn't you think the likes of, of SAP and all that, right, they're aware of this and within their suite? But the, the space itself for an entrepreneur sounds so intimidating, and right? you've got all these embedded guys there, and they just add in a, a module that's called you know, social and, and game over. So you don't think so? I've not seen it happening yet. Wow, interesting. Okay. Microsoft has got that, right? To SharePoint, nobody uses it. Nobody yeah. uses it. But they just bought Yammer, so they're looking at three years to put it in but without it. Three years, huh? Wow, okay. And here's the point, right? So there's some, I mean, some companies are starting to see the writing in the world. Not all of them will be executing across all these areas. But uh, we see enough of our clients starting to make investments into these areas that for the right proposition from the right entrepreneur, I mean, it is a white space. I remember the white spaces also with the paper clip in Microsoft Word, right? <laughs> <laughs> Karan, you just okay. grab a light easier. Yeah. Just to remind everyone that you know, in a white space, in a, some slide many years ago, was this you know, uh, enterprise application and assistant, right? So they developed this clippy in you know, Microsoft Word. Just because it's a white space doesn't mean anyone will go there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, kind of a bit of caution. <laughs> um, the next kind of trend to talk about is, um, I mean, all of you all know more than me, online shopping, online commerce, and heavy. The big trend we see is in terms of multi-channel retail. It's not online, but multi-channel. So very few people, I mean, across product categories, uh, relatively small proportion of uh, the full end-to-end -end life cycle of the sale. So consideration. So how you read this is start a consideration where I'm considering different brands. And then evaluate a subset which I care about. Then I go to the right and I make a purchase. Then I have some form of experience of it. And then I be an advocate of some sort. You know, so loyalty, blah, blah. So this is how we think about the consumer purchase life cycle. Uh, very few product categories have material, uh, critical mass of buyers where all of that is done in one channel be it online or physical or brick and mortars. Increasingly, you see a lot of it becoming multi-channel. There are a lot of the upfront consideration and research is done online. The purchase may be online, maybe bricks and mortar. The experience will be partially online, partially bricks and mortar, blah, 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 right? So a lot of the consumer companies who, and, and no consumer country and co company I know has cracked the code on being able to deliver that multi-channel experience. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities in around you know, enhancing that, that, that circle. 
uh, I won't go through this detail, but it just shows um, for different product categories, we contrasted 2010, 2011, some surveys we've done, the proportion of research that's being done online. There's some, you know, fairly significant shifts you observe across categories. Uh, is that across age groups, guys who are like uh, above 40s or so are uh, doing a lot of yeah. research, you know, on yeah. online consideration? Yeah. Okay. So we take a market like Indonesia, I spend a lot of time there. Uh, you'd be amazed the amount, the, so, I mean, everyone says, talks about low, low broadband countries in Indonesia. So Indonesia, I mean, to the extent you're in a, in a, in a white space market, I'm sure they'll take off. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's probably about 35% internet penetration. Right, it's less than 5% broadband penetration, but 35% internet penetration, that will hit 50% in three years. Uh, in a market like that, if you think about who is doing a lot of the online commerce, you'd expect young yeah. teenagers, sub-30 you know, sub year old in urban centers. Uh, the most intense e-commerce users are the 30 to 50 year olds outside the major urban centers because they have no alternative. Wow. Uh, in terms of product selection, product character, uh, uh, it, it's very interesting to see how the market evolves. So all that to say that, uh, uh, again, huge opportunity here. I don't think it's pure online. I think it's, it's, it's a multi-channel experience and how you find it. Um, I won't go to devices. Uh, you guys have heard about that already. One thing which is not on the stage is uh, we also see a lot of our traditional clients in healthcare, education, and financial services start to get a bit worried about this. Um, I'll just talk a bit about healthcare, which is a space I do a bit of work in. So Malaysia, I don't know if you know, has got the highest incidence of diabetes in the world. Um, large part due to our very cheap sugar. Uh, very cheap sugar. <laughs> um, and uh, if you look at the cost to the Malaysian healthcare system of being able to treat diabetic patients, I mean, it's, it's staggering. Uh, many beds are filled, uh, public sector beds are filled by diabetes patients. Um, if you look at how it's treated today, there's no pre-hospital treatment. Uh, to, to speak of, um, and, and everything is, uh, you know, it, it's very traditional treatment as applied to diabetes. There's a whole lot of opportunities around thinking through an integrated uh, full pathway disease management for diabetes, which will involve a lot of technology type intervention. So people talk about integrated treatment of disease class. Um, so this is not about building a fully integrated hospital. Right? If, if you think about an, a treatment disease class, the, the average diabetes patient will spend, you know, five, ten hours of the year in front of a doctor or in a hospital. Most of the treatment is going to happen outside a hospital, not interfacing with the doctor. A lot of the remote tribe interface, it's uh, folks like you guys with technology you can provide, which is going to enable. And it's going to be massively disruptive. And in Malaysia, for example, the public system pays for it, so it's potentially a huge savings. In other countries, the interest insurance sure. guys pay for it, and so they've been pushing it. Uh, but you know, these are proven solutions out there, and you know, ready market, uh, white spaces that have been tapped in other markets and waiting to be tapped in these markets. So anyway, uh, but that's interesting. I think next week, uh, on Tuesday here, I think there's going to be a, a launch of a. Would you want to call it a product or a company? Which has got a, a diabetic, a diabetes, you know, targeted app, right? It's a product. It's a product. Prototype. Please come. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's funded by Cradle, so it's quite interesting to, to see that. And I think today the newspapers also saw, I saw uh, was it BP Healthcare, right? It's one of the, the clinic, large clinical groups. They also had an ad about an, an app that you can download. And I, I don't know whether it's around uh, uh, diabetes, but it's a health related app too. So that's obviously a big space. And, and I think uh, uh, G over there is also playing in the space, but he's in the high-end HIS systems. So you wonder when he's going to come down and play in that consumer space too. But interesting. Yeah, and uh, just to add, uh, across the region also we are seeing telcos when their core services are you know, having a challenge there in terms of uh, revenues for normal voice or SMS and things like that. So they are looking at other vertical opportunities. So healthcare is one of those uh, areas mm -hmm. where across the region we are seeing a lot of interest and a lot of demand from uh, Telco Health. And if you look, if you were Las Vegas CES show, I mean the, the amount of devices that are coming out which are mobile centric but are also healthcare devices. It's huge, huge yeah. yeah. I mean, to, to just share, I uh, guess an angle though. Who is it? I mean, 
Oh, it's probably okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Just, just let me uh, share this. I don't know because somebody from a large company that's doing a huge project in Iskandar uh, told me that uh, Samsung is working on a lot of very advanced cutting edge healthcare solutions also, and uh, it was because they want this company to uh, to use their, their technology in in their holistic uh, well. Uh, uh, development in Iskandar. So they took them down to Korea to see what they're doing. It. And Samsung actually has a mirror, right? So when you wake up in the morning, and he didn't say whether you have to stand naked in front of the mirror. I should have asked him that. <laughs> but you just stand in front of the mirror, whether we close on or not. And apparently the mirror will read your, your the, 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 uh, the aura or whatever that your body sends out, right? And it can tell you that, you know, for this morning, you need to take a vitamin C or a vitamin B complex. And you know, it blew my mind. And he said that he was there, and it blew his mind that you've got technology to that extent, you know, that can do that. And he said Samsung intends eventually for that to be in everyone's homes. Wives. Today it's called wives, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, good one. Uh, okay. At least but, with the wives, she'll lie to you. you know? <laughs> Okay, but that's really interesting. So, uh, sorry, I, I cut you off. Was it Nimal? You wanted to say something? No, no, no. Oh, yeah, that, okay. So, but uh, there's some incredible stuff going on in the healthcare space for sure. Uh, did, did I cut one of you off? You wanted to add something on this? Okay. No, I was uh, saying, uh, I was talking about the healthcare opportunity uh, in, in the telco space across the region. And uh, we are also seeing some of the work going into education uh, setup, which is like uh, providing education through electronic means. So, for example, in government, uh, government of India was kind of subsidizing a tablet called Akash. Didn't took it so well. There were practical challenges with respect to the um, performance of the device and things like that. But the point is, the idea is the government is trying to take education to the masses, and you know, um, we can enable it through, from the, through our partners, uh, you know, telcos and things like that. So, I mean, it reminds me to the thing that earlier people used to come to hospital. Now we are talking about taking hospital to people, whether it could be in a small pieces like a small or medium like a device, mobile phone or a tablet or a, um, you know, e-health method or tele, whatever, telehealth or whatever health that we may call it. But the point is we are taking healthcare system, we are taking education system to masses using these devices. Okay. Yeah. So I remember now, so I think I cut you off, right? You want to ask a question? She has a oh, question. Evelyn, okay. Yeah, I have a few okay. <laughs> yeah, the question is actually about the devices, because when it comes to healthcare and education, we may not be talking about smartphones. So how, uh, what kind of devices are actually well, we're looking at? Because we're looking at low end, right? So could you say something about, um, like, I'm an educator and have content, but Putting it on smartphones, it isn't going to get to the to the right people. Correct. So, so the people who need that kind of education, they don't have those smartphones. Though we see the trend that smartphone prices are coming down, a lot of um, adoption of smartphones is going to happen because of that. The prediction is that by 2016 or something, we'll have more than one billion smartphones. Uh, you know, with with people. I mean, maybe more than that. But the but the point is. There are uh, people who are working on small, small applications, which are which can be, um, you know, provided on basic, uh, basic uh, devices as well. Those can be uh, running on Java or primarily Java or Brew, those, those operating systems. But yes, there are those applications available, and a lot of device companies are also putting a lot of effort into it. I mean, for example, Nokia. Nokia has got something called Nokia Life, where they have learning uh, small bit of learning piece there. You can, uh, you know, learn English. You can learn many languages, and you know things like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think they, they, they well, it was okay. I still alive, right? I, <laughs> I, I thought this was the way. They're selling the headquarters now. I know, so I was surprised. And also the the, the wars that we saw between handsets. You know, that the, the the structure of that war is going to change when, when the Chinese release 50 ringgit tablets. Right? Give, you know, you don't need the government to give one to everybody. It will happen organically, right? So if you look at the price points, if you look at you know where the screens are going, the reality is everyone's going to have a large screen device, right? So so the question of can someone afford it at a fifty ringgit price point, I think yeah. But it's coming. It's not here yet. 
Yeah, it'll come a lot faster than we think. I mean, uh, you know. that's interesting. I, I think if you are an entrepreneur, you think that form factor is coming and it's going to be in everybody's hands, right? So you work on an application today that will be ready when the device is there. I mean, the last thing you know, sorry to contradict you, is start developing Java MP games for Nokia phones. I think that's <laughs> kind of a dead end like, as far as the business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't kick somebody when they're down, bro. <laughs> okay, sorry, I think there was a question at the oh, sorry, one second, at the far end there, yeah. Oh, you're saying 200 ringgit, huh? Okay, I, I think Karan is saying 50 ringgit, which is stunning. Yeah. Oh, because of the subsidy no, of the Chinese government. You get that 200 ringgit is going to go down to 50 ringgit, yeah. I'd say. There, there is no okay. natural reason we are not. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, I mean, just imagine uh, what price did we pay when we bought our first phone maybe in mid 90s, and now what is the price? What do we get today from the hardware capabilities, from functionality, from look and feel, and everything? So it has come down drastically, and now is the time when we have. I mean, that time we used to have only four or five big brands. Now we have I don't know how many, 200 or 300 maybe. So, <laughs> so, so you know the point is uh, there's a lot of competition, so which is driving innovation and the prices uh, price comes down. So yeah, again, I think just coming back to the UX point, right? The form factor of a tablet uh, is really an important one. So you know, don't device, don't assume a mobile device is the thing that we can have in our pocket now with this small screen. Right? It really, the design for interaction, the design for interactability and aesthetics is coming very, very important. So there's a question. Yes, good. Yeah, um, the question is for, you know, I should understand a bit of For some of you, right, if you've got already got your own application out there, your own software you're doing, if you want to ask them a question about how to mobilize it also, yeah, please, you know, shoot, shoot the panel that question. Or maybe somebody in the audience will answer you also. So, uh, so uh, listen, listen, listen. <laughs> uh, let me answer you broadly first, and then come to more specific, right? So, if you look at if you look at most of the mobility type uh, applications. A lot of it comes down to, I mean, the sell to the enterprise is a form of either increased productivity, so I save costs, uh, or else uh, increased effectiveness in terms of doing something more productive elements or customer facing. Um, the reality is it's very hard for a startup to make that sell, the sale, the pitch to an enterprise. It's very difficult. Um, the good thing is that many of the enterprises are coming to that realization themselves. Uh, often with the help of their consultants. But, um, <laughs> <coming> to... <laughs> hey, don't plug in, man. <laughs> Realization themselves. Uh, well, current plug for that. They're yeah, exactly one way. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, the, 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 I guess it, the first point I have to make is uh, don't fight the uphill battle, right? You've got to find the targets where that, that evangelization has already been done and they're out there looking for the solution because it's very hard to shift them. Otherwise, uh, that's the first talk. Then the second talk is that uh, depending on the specific context, of the uh, enterprise, there's going to be certain horizontal, and I mean, I mean, horizontal applications by definition apply to all of them, uh, and so depending on where they are, you push those. But then certain vertical ones become particularly interesting, right? And the ones which I find easiest to kind of sell are the um, the workforce management type applications, uh, because the proposition is just so compelling. It's just cannot be better. And and from there, I mean, the others are a bit more tricky, but that's where I will start. Uh, I'm not sure what 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 your proposition. Would, uh, not sure what what company, what what product or service. Oh, you are veterans. Okay. <laughs> so. So a bit of background as well. Um, looking at the price mobility, uh, I would have to say with great humility, I guess with the products that they made in the game, I mean, comparing to Shell, I think they've embarked in like 2008, 2009. But again, their context of mobility is pure device. Mobility. Um, so right now, when this is actually added over to me, we should look at the broad strategy for the group and all that. I think um, the discussion is a lot around still around devices, um, using devices, managing inventory traffic. So it's very end-to-end centric. But, but what I found on the other extreme as well is that, um, and, and I'm sure it's, it's, it's a, it resonates across the group, is that these users are actually 
there's no pitching involved. So by the users are actually well involved. So take for example like our EVP for finance has like seven different devices. And he's the kind of guy he's who's overpaid. Really, <laughs> but uh, he's the kind of guy who's like really, really passionate. So you see a GC management very passionate about mobility and they want to see things happen. But then again the paradox is with the uh, current offering with, from the market right now. If you look at things like I think we spoke to you yourself about what the enterprise can offer. I think SAP, Cyclo, and things like that's a bit more audio centric. But they can miss out the user experience there. And I find that's actually the the biggest challenge that I have because user experience is very broad. It takes into cultural context and, and it you and that interweaves things like enterprise social as well. So within one umbrella, you should have quite a few trends which are converging, and that's the level of expectation the, the group has for, for, for mobility. That's sort of like the background and a bit of a challenge actually. And I would say even an opportunity as well, because there's not much within the space. Um, I think, take for example, the Petronas Dynamite app, which you don't know the app store, was done by a company which is what, five times limited. So I think it's a huge, huge space here, but I think I think that uh, I think this this whole basket case of talent should really capitalize on that. No, I absolutely agree. This is one point to add from the from the I mean, for, for most of you on the other side, I mean your side, it's not that easy as well because uh, once you're convinced of the once you're convinced of the value add and what you want to do, and the device is obviously the easy part of it, right? Because it's more cost play and security play and what have you. It's the next level of services and applications that where you see the true value. I think uh, it's not clear where you go. Because the SAPs of the world honestly don't have that compelling solutions in and around enterprise mobility. Uh, they have very strong solutions in the core business, yeah. but this is not the core business. This is not about putting on SAP. The core business is very strong. But uh, it, it, it's. If I may add, that just adds to the cross selling value of, uh, cross selling proposition and not exactly delivering the value that. Uh, Correct. 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 Because there, I think, just a matter of the there are products are being designed for catering majority of the customers, not. You know, targeting the fish that we talked that we spoke earlier. I mean, why did um, WhatsApp is so popular today? Because they did not have built in uh, you know fancies in in the product. They were having very simple uh, <coughs> uh, simple service that could be delivered to their customers. And then they may have added few more features. That's all right. But uh, when, when big companies add their product, they create those products and add those features, which adds up the cost and doesn't really serve the purpose as you are actually saying. Just, just an, uh, you know, uh, sidetrack, which is, you know, there's a whole new methodology in developing products called Agile, right, which, you know, to some extent is very counter-cultural to the traditional, you know, traditional way of developing products where you spec everything up front. And we're finding that, you know, that traditional way of project management of development really isn't relevant anymore, right? You've got to launch something out, get it out in the market quick and augment and iterate. Um, so, you know, but you know, doing things in an agile manner um, requires a whole new mindset, and there's a cultural shift in doing that, particularly if you're in a large organization where, if it's not specified and it's not spec, you don't buy it. And the reality is, you may have to buy something that is, you know, twenty percent spec, and then you 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 figure it out along the way. I guess Petronas can be disruptive itself, or you can organize the the Petronas, you know, uh, mobile productivity right. challenge, you know. And have all these guys, you know, uh, uh, come up and develop something for you guys for your needs, right? Yeah, seriously. I mean, you unleash the, the crazy creativity and, and talent of the people in this room itself, right? And with the accelerator, the, the I train is about to start. So there's going to be a very specific mobile-based, you know, uh, accelerator that is going to be launched out of CyberJaya, right? With CyberView, and that's coming. Uh, you read about it on, on in DAA on Friday, I guess. So I have a last question. Yep. <laughs> Looking at the technology again, breaking the cap that I read, um, I, I can be a technology evangelist and be passionate about technology and kind of services and the user interface and the user experience component, right? Uh, but then again, if, if I put my other cap and looking at the KPEX and the OPEX and the numbers on my spreadsheet, uh, it seems to be like Singapore has a bit of that right now with Singtel and they, they would actually take over the infrastructure and device management capability so the organization as a whole can concentrate on developing training services, mobile services. Um, is there anything, I, I've heard shadows and moments, um, would you be able to comment if there's any potential offering from any telco within this space, basically uh, managed mobility? I'm 
mainly a shadow and a murmur. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, would you guys want to get coming and opening? Yeah. Who is who is we then? Already, yeah, one thousand users. Okay. So it's economy of scale, and telcos can't help the country reproduce. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> Maybe the Sabah RCR can help boost the population. <laughs> um, again, so, so I, I think that you know, some have said a, a, a straw man argument to say that uh, superior telco infrastructure is necessary for an app-based economy, because China has shown that it that it isn't necessarily uh, um, you know, a, a requirement. The second person is telcos struggle themselves, and nearly every telco has taken the decision to to form some form of digital initiative that is separate from the telco because the mindsets in a telco right now is to sell bandwidth for ten bucks a, a pop, right? And, um, and so I think all Malaysian telcos in, in particular are coming to this mindset of that we do need separate commercial entities to tackle this business, not. Beside them within, within the utility business. And, and that's what Exata is doing right with you, right? Your, that's right. Yeah. He, so, uh, uh, Karan was with Cellcom, and I think he has just, as of what, three weeks ago, transitioned out and he's, he's parked under a new uh, business unit in Exata called what again? Exata Digital Services. Okay, Exata Digital Services. So it's going to act like an internal disruptor, right, within the company. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Now, did any of you want to address this? Whether Malaysia is ready for the app economy? And then, sorry, sir, I'll go to you, right? You had a question, okay. I got uh, two comments here. One is that most of the applications do not really need a large bandwidth. That, that is one. Yeah, no, we're not really talking about bandwidth. We're talking about, you know, like, I need to come out with a special... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, with okay, I'm coming to it. One, one is you don't need it. On the other hand, telcos have spent a lot of money in creating 3G, 4G, these kind of infrastructure, right? Right now, the challenge with them is they don't really have network utilization, I mean, the network utilizations are very low. So out of compulsion, they need to think about how am I going to fill this network that I've already created. And the bigger uh, problem is that this network is anyway perishable. If I don't use it for a minute, it's gone, it's a waste. That's why you see a lot of 
on net calls being offered by telcos for free or you know, some very limited quantity. So the point is, they have to out of compulsion need to think about how am I, am I going to increase my network utilization. When it comes about creating a unique proposition or a value, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of an offer for a customer, I think that's a that's a challenge because uh, because you you need to have that critical mass. If, if a company goes that I need you know ten kind of SIM cards for ten ringgit data plans, so operators say okay, we'll think about it. You know, and if a big company, large company goes okay and say that okay, I'm going to um, give you five hundred. RM per user and things like that, and here are my proposal things. So you know, you there those are economies of scale kind of thing we are talking about, right? So there you don't really have economies of scale. There you probably have it's a better value proposition. But I think slowly but steadily we see that telcos are changing their mindset. They need to look at. I mean, the they're coming down the value chain. You know, it's like earlier companies used to create products only to cater to the masses now. Now then slowly they started talking about segmentations. And I know for sure in telcos they are looking at segmenting customers to a level of one. You know, they're you know, that's the holy grail. So that's the, that's, for a long time. Yeah, that's the kind of thinking. But the point is when you have that kind of a name, you're slowly trickling down the value chain. And that's where you more such products would definitely come in future. Yeah. Yeah. One more question then. You know, uh, for the app developers here, there are three main platforms you want to look at, right? Uh, also the Android. We have the iOS, and you pay even pay attention to Microsoft, such a late pay attention. Yeah, it's Blackberry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Blackberry, or if you are in Indonesia, yeah. You forgot to You forgot to get That's for you. Yeah, all the platforms. Okay. Uh, what would the challenges be? I mean, what should uh, an app developer, because every, almost every app developer I see, they'll talk iOS, they'll talk Android. Uh, not many really paying attention to Microsoft. Microsoft to the game should app developers do that as well. What see, in, your in, in my experience, you know, all all of us also know why did why do Apple have hundreds of billion dollars with them? For the simple reason that people pay for those applications. That's why there is a community which is ready to develop those applications for them. So very simple. Look where the money is. Where going? I mean, it's very simple. I mean, I don't have to be a rocket scientist to say that. But the point is. Android is an operating system that we see has already taken off, and it's a, it's it's a, you know, majority of, of the people are going to use it. But are they willing to pay, or will they be paying enough money for developer community to sustain? That's a big question. So, so point is, we need to have those applications which are, which people should be ready to pay. It doesn't, uh, you know, matter whether it's an um, Android operating system, whether it's iOS. I mean, gone are those days when. But people who could afford the uh, costliest phone would only go for Apple. See, the point is they are also looking at value now. So slowly, the I mean, I'm sure everyone, at least personally, I believe that Apple's value proposition, which it used to have five years ago, is now slowly coming down, and people are exploring with other operating systems. And Android is there. BlackBerry 10. We I also hope that BB10 is going to do well for them, and. Uh, Microsoft, you know, the third one there. And, you know, before you say, I also um, hear from operators that they also need a third operating system there, third platform for them to sustain and take their take their applications to customers. Uh, okay, let me answer it this way before, you know, before I get crucified by any of the vendors. <laughs> but, um, you know, imagine a world where, you know, mobile isn't your phone. And, and you go, you know, and, and I've seen this happen, right? You, you enter a car and there's there's an OS in the car head, you know, in the car dashboard. You have a fridge and there's an OS in that fridge. And you have a TV and that OS is in that TV. And you have a handset and that OS is in that handset. Which are you most likely to develop for? And you know, I, I'll leave that question on where that what that OS is, but. You know, if I was a developer and I see that, you know, that, that proliferation of, of uh, hardware platforms, I'd go for that, right? Okay, uh, sir, do you have a question? Hold on. Uh, I just need to add three uh, discussions. Uh, we've got ten more minutes, and then I'd like to wrap it up, right? Unfortunately, the device, if I may use the word cartel, especially the 
very famous mobile 6.5 today. So just a, a benefit of the room today, uh, with this mobile 6.5, at least with the oil and gas sector, it's a shift from the in and And the roadmap forward for Microsoft, at least to my knowledge right now, is Windows 8 from the, from the end of the year. So that's where you have things like augmented reality, where let's say a part engineer walk around the platform, and then you actually have your camera, and that overlays your 3D, right? Yeah. There's a pipe where you can actually identify them. So that's one of the prototypes SAP had, but the issue is uh, bringing these devices into this environment so that you don't want your platform to go away. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned augmented reality because I'm extremely disappointed the panel didn't mention AR, man. <laughs> but okay, sir, you go first. You've got a question waiting uh, patiently. Isn't life augmented uh, reality? Uh, uh, isn't life augmented reality? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I guess just on the enterprise one. So, I mean, we've had a lot of experience in the enterprise space just dealing with customers. I've had comments from CIO as to what is your mobile strategy as to make sure that everyone in senior executive client has. So those are kind of wrong for the business to start from. Um, so what we found in the enterprise space, and this is not just Malaysia, this is actually quite global, is, um, and we heard some comments around SAP doesn't have a solution or this company doesn't have a solution. And I think that's the fundamental problem. Everyone says there has to be a solution. Uh, the problem is that when you go to the solution level, you're likely not even solving a problem. You're probably just skipping multiple steps. And where we see an enterprise organization really succeed is when they kind of take a step forward and they do a bit of value engineering or they do some, uh, I guess the terminology now is a design thinking. You do some storyboarding, you really connect it to what you're, you have, at the end of the day, you have to solve something. If you're not solving something, uh, you're just creating something. And there's just things out there. Um, and it, this, this is not just in the end, this is happening in the enterprise space all the time. And that's why you see a lot of uh, solutions kind of not succeeding or the adoption is just not there in the organization. And there's no roadmap for, additional value that's being added beyond what they might have piloted. Uh, the other piece to that is that, and how uh, organizations have kind of gotten away from that shift is enterprise operates an enterprise, consumer space, startups, all these guys are operating in a whole different world. But there's, you're starting to see a convergence now, and that convergence has to be adopted across both organizations or both sets of groups and individuals. Um, so what we're finding now is actually, what we're trying to do is actually connect the enterprise to this group because we see a lot of creative types, uh, Fantastic technical skill, uh, but that all sits kind of in the startup space, and these guys will not work for enterprise. They will not work for an organization like that. Uh, so you have all this lost talent that you will never ingrain in those kinds of organizations. On the other side, you have the scalability, you have real problems in enterprise that need to be resolved. So you need to connect it to. Uh, and connecting it to either means developing that culture within your organization, uh, and then hiring those and being attracted to those kinds of individuals, or actually opening up the platform so actually now there's a convergence and, and the, the ecosystem can kind of thrive based on that. So I don't think any disruption is really going to happen unless that conversion is happening. Uh, and just on the comment around whether Malaysia is ready for apps, uh, I think we talked about infrastructure. Uh, I guess the question back to the panel really is, or anyone else in the room, is, um, so I see apps coming out all the time, but they're not really solving my problem. Um, they might be an, a taxi app, or I call it a taxi, and you might laugh at this one. But, but there's someone else on the other end of the line getting calling a taxi for me and it just got there. Um, so how do we, so the big... Hey, we said move beyond that, man. Yeah, <laughs> so if we create an app, or if someone creates an app, uh, let's, so let's just take it away then as, as an example. It's only going to be as success, uh, successful as the users who use it, and whether it's solving a problem for them and whether they value for it. So I guess you can think of it the other way. You're creating apps for people to solve their problem, but I think reverse, how do you think we need to disrupt the behaviors in the market to adapt to some of the creative things that are coming out? Because you're saying, find, I think you find some fantastic apps that are very, very amazing, and if you travel anywhere else outside of this region or outside of this country, you're like, this would work. But then in Malaysia, it just doesn't fly. Um, so how do, you, how do you kind of see us getting over that obstacle in Malaysia? I think that's interesting, because you want to then say to keep it simple, right? And I, I saw a short video of a closed door session at, at GSMA. If those of you know, that's, that's the world's leading uh, uh, telco uh, industry exhibition and conference that's held in Barcelona every year. It was a closed door session with a futurist, and, and he actually asked uh, the audience a question about how many of you uh, understand the functionalities of your phone? And the video was a bit grainy, but I think very few people put up their hands. Then he said, How many of you understand, you know, uh, some of the apps, you know, that are in your phone, and apparently very few people put up their hands also. So this notion that you're trying to adjust the behavior of the market to, to be ready for the sophisticated apps that are there, 
it, it's sexy to think so, but in reality, I think this keep it simple somehow still works, you know. Because I, I do agree that the technology of the apps, right, some of the leading edge apps is running ahead of the user's ability to maximize them. But your, your question is asking them how to bridge that. Yeah. Which is the death? Death map. Yeah. 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 Keep it so simple, you don't care how it yeah. does. You know how you're making noise bombs. Yeah. Yeah. You know how it's transmitted from the airwaves and all that. <laughs> you know about the history of my phone. You, know, you don't care. You hey, don't ask me now, these are questions. Yeah, yeah, I guess so, the point. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, Nimal, do you have to take a yeah. search question? Uh, uh, actually, there's two points there, both are quite interesting. Philosophically, right? uh, if we talk about the enterprise mobility space, um, the the, the non-scalable solution to that is to say that uh, every company's got a very specific problem, and it requires a very adapted solution, which has got to be customized for that entity. And so there's no solutioning which goes on. It's basically a fit-for-purpose uh, product that gets created to address the need of a particular company, and, and that happens a lot today, right? That happens a lot today. And so those are a bit ahead, you know, this part earlier and what have you. Um, if you look at what's happening, for example, in the SME space, and, and, and creating very simple, this is not enterprise mobility, but this is basic solutions for, for SMEs um, in, 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 in terms of, uh, uh, you know, connectivity plus plus, let's call it, right? So it's connectivity, close user groups, some basic very added services. Um, it, it starts to straddle both, right? So it, it's, it's package solutions with some minimum amount of adaptation with a local value that we sell it who kind of goes at scale and deploys it uh, for the SME. I mean, I personally think that's the, that's the model. Or that's the kind of model that needs to come about for enterprise mobility to scale up. I'm not talking about Petronas, which is big enough that someone can go in and do it for you alone. I'm talking about in a, in a massive scale, right? So, I, I mean, honestly, I think... Um, It'll be somewhere in between. I don't think it will be as specific as what you articulated, but that's where it is now. Uh, it has to be solving a problem, obviously. But uh, it doesn't scale unless there's some degree of productization which happens in around that first thought, philosophical. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the second one, um, I mean, about the Malaysia configure being so different that you know no apps are found at home here. I mean, not. I mean, I, I find that hard to believe. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, the, the taxi apps, for example, right? Uh, was it about my taxi? Yeah. Well? <laughs> uh, and then the slogan, yeah, it's tagline is so sexy, I gotta say. <laughs> <laughs> my taxi. Yeah, the taxi monger, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what's in the back office. There could be a good thing. <laughs> I have no idea what's in the back office. Uh, and uh, they, they they don't have near enough scale need to. But uh, you know, I mean, it, it's there is a specific problem most Malaysians face that it seeks to fix. I'm not saying it fixes it well, <laughs> but there's a very specific problem it seeks to fix. And if it gets scale, or the first one that gets scale, to your point, it's not the best one that will win, it's the first one that gets scale, will win. When it gets scale, I mean, it will be relatively ubiquitous. I don't know who it will be, but it's such a problem, right? So, um, again, maybe, maybe a rambling answer to uh, the random, uh, but. I don't think anything comes about so different, right? People are people, people have problems. If you can fix that problem, I'll, I'll use it. Mm. You, anyway, I think just addressing that quickly, when, uh, when you said talk about fixing a problem, one of the billionaire entrepreneurs in Malaysia actually personally messaged one of the two, you know, taxi apps, you know, and, and asked them to meet up with his people because they thought they could use it in their business. So, again, if it solves a problem, you know, people will uh, have a look at it. But I think also Serb's question was quite specific as to how do you move users, right, to start adapting, change their behavior to adapt some of the more, you know, uh, I guess sophisticated, right, so advanced think, apps so out there. Even if we have an app that we're talking about picking up the phone, it's a step, it's a problem, right? Yeah. So I guess how do we bridge even from that to get to something even more seamless? Than more seamless. So since the, the McKinsey guy is philosophical, I have to up the idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, I'm sure you wanted to be a consultant of that. I it it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a meme in this conversation, but you know, you know Malcolm Gladwell had this, this concept called plurality of perfect. Who, Malcolm or Gladwell? Okay. The guy, uh, the, what the dog saw. 
And it's this concept that, you know, there is no one solution, there's no one idea of perfection that will fit all. And those are, those are the days where you had, you know, Windows 3.0 and everybody took it and you live with it. The reality is in the app space in particular, there will be different versions of apps that will fit your particular need that no one, you know. And, and so when you are in this, this development mode, be ready to morph your product, right? The product that you sell to Petronas may be completely different from, from, from the product that you, you sell to BP or to, uh, what's that for them? Petron. Yeah. Petron. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <send me> well. <laughs> um, and so the, the question then becomes how fast can you adapt your base platform to the plurality of perfect solutions that, that will be. So there, there's a continuum of perfect solutions. You will never get a perfect app. Yeah, but you can just have an incremental value attached to it. I mean, this reminds to me, uh, again, coming back to the mobile phone, just imagine uh, who would have thought, I mean, the person who invented mobile phone himself would not have thought that he would have been, if this product would have been used, uh, would be used like this. So from, I mean, pretty far, um, you know, wherever we can go, we just imagine what device we saw first or what device we remember first. And then what is the kind of device we see today? So it has disrupted so many um, industries along the way and now it has become so powerful that, you know, we want to do everything with it. Okay, so just a question, yeah, for the end, yeah. Okay. I got any more questions because then we're going to wrap up. Okay, one there. So, okay. any on this side of the room? Okay. Oh, you want to be the last one? Yeah. Hey, I have the last one in now. Okay. Yeah. My name is James. James, okay. Okay, I'll just three simple questions. <laughs> My first question, what are your take uh, on something uh, gimmicky that people just play with it on. It's something to stay in. How far is the market? That's my first question. The second question, are there any competent or cost-effective developers doing augmented reality which are actually going to start a company and looking for developers like that? And the last question is, is there something... You're looking for a miracle, of bro. Competent and cost-effective, bro. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Ain't gonna happen if I try. Okay, you gonna try. Yeah. 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 How do we actually, uh, like using McKinsey, McKinsey is expensive, you know. People like McKinsey. Can't do it for free. Can't do it for free. Just say McKinsey is bidding in our company. So it's a start of companies like this actually give us a heads up in terms of compiling uh, some of the so-called writers that we always have. So something, something like that. My, I mean, I, I won't claim to be a, a soothsayer, but you know, I took my, my kids to Disneyland. You know, they spent the time wearing those 3D glasses looking at augmented reality and they didn't take them off until they came into the plane. <laughs> so is there a market for augmented reality? Yes. Right. Beyond that, that you know, the most app yeah. Reality. Yeah. So, you know, how, how that will morph and you know, the market space is probably, I, I have no idea. But, uh, sorry, I mean, these are... Just, I'm sorry. Of augmented reality. <clears throat> okay, I do apologize, uh, everyone. The context I'll use is really audience. Yeah. Um, okay, like I think for example the recent incident in PFK, uh, where there was a casualty, right? So what actually happened was, uh, if I pledge, he was trying to service that bar, and as he was laying out his diagrams, the whole thing just blew away, and there was a casualty, people who died. So the notion of augmented reality is actually quite serious here. So I like, brought up the example where uh, the Cyclo SAP application, where you have an augmented reality and you can sketch it over there, and you can identify the part and all that. I, I do believe there are some serious use cases for it. Um, yeah, it's just that where you for me to say it. Augmented reality voting. There's a demand there for sure, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, these are initial days for augmented reality and what I what we know is that um, the development for this particular technology is going to the chipset level. As uh, some of the large companies or you know there are very few who um, I mean who provide chipset for mobile devices. So, so yes, I mean, Snapdragon is from Qualcomm, Qualcomm, MediaTek, uh, these are few, some of the large companies, or maybe majority of the business is with them only. So they are working on this augmented reality. And back in India, um, two years ago, I saw some uh, demo also, uh, which was on Snapdragon S4 or something like that. So there, you know, 
point is there are people who are working on these applications, but I think the real use case or you know, the adoption has not come as yet. So as you said, it is trend is there to stay, but we need to figure out the real sort of an, uh, use case and an application for that one. But then, then having been said, yeah, I mean, if you look at processor size, uh, processor speeds and speed sizes, definitely they, they, you have the hardware capability to yeah. promote such a thing. Don't forget, Project Lab has done this yeah. one, right? Yeah. They didn't develop his hands, they really started building apps. And they just, everyone's hand, this running Android. And, and you know, try not to pick too hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as long as you can turn Android, right? Just saying. Alex, just want to put a phone in this <laughs> okay, sorry, there's a question for you, Vikesh, right? Okay. Yeah, this is you. Because as an Android developer, right, you can't sell OT on the market because we're, our country is not under this. So, either that. Our country is not under what? It's not under this. We, we don't have so Google Checkout as much in Yeah, yeah. so we cannot sell applications on the Android market. But if you can do it, ask for donation through PayPal, oh. you donate to me, or, or set up your own store, right? So, yeah, will Malaysia get on this list? It will. It will. I mean, I don't represent Google, yeah. but it will. Will Azenta yeah. help us sell the apps? Very interesting. But why is Azenta going to help you? If you're a developer, <laughs> you should give a business model that you can sell yourself. Don't expect to tell them. No, 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 no. Because, um, because you, want, you want to go all around the world, yeah. right away, instead of trying to do something from scratch, then try to promote that. Market to market. I mean, if you're building what Azenta has in terms of using mobile services on the cell phone in the Sri Lanka land and the Bangladesh land, then of course they can help you because they're going to make money out of it too. But if it's just an app, then no. You've got to basically kind of market it, right? Okay. And don't just think about setting off one house for an app. Think about subscription models, put in PayPal, get people to buy it off other ways. It's not just one way to set an app, right? So, we thought, we thought you go to Singapore and register a company. Right? Oh, yeah, I tried, I tried, but they need a little bit to do that. Oh, yeah, it needs to do it. I mean, when Microsoft took their route, when Microsoft didn't sell apps here, right? And people still went to their program, so why can't okay. you guys do the same thing, right? Okay, good. Yeah, uh, sorry, Karan, were you going to add something? No, that's fine. Okay, okay. okay. All right. uh, I think I saw the hand go up first again, and then uh, G, okay? Exactly. 
going away. Excellent. Okay, uh, uh, the last question. Uh, my name is Terry. Uh, so before I go on by uh, being here, I just to that gentleman that now who was asking about where is the market for automation? Yeah. Sorry, Terry, are you somebody rich that everybody can watch after this? <laughs> I guess too much uh, information on there. You said there may be a little bit of information that's too much, but I understand. So it's a bit out of the topic uh, in mobile, but I'll just quickly ask the panel. And then for the other two questions, I guess I, I really want to end this so that people can network. And if you have uh, questions, right, just approach the panel. Yeah. So I uh, give, give some chance for people to network before we, we end the evening, right? So do you just want to answer that? Uh, you've got your hand up persistently, so I, I like persistence, but I got to respect the, the time we're over to already. Okay. Yeah, because uh, my company actually developed uh, augmented reality. We are one of the guys who actually started way back in 2010 when we had the developed the desktop and the web-based platform. And right now we go into the uh, consider the mobile solutions, uh, which is a very exciting uh, avenue. And uh, on the what uh, one of the difficulties that we understand on uh, AR itself, um, a lot of uh, considered graphic designers. Uh, they are actually good in designing graphics. When it comes to AR, they don't have the programming language. You know, they have problems actually uh, interfacing with. So we actually developed something which is uh, easy to use. Uh, anybody who doesn't have the programming language language itself can actually just uh, execute it, doing a presentation on that. And the particular module itself will be actually out somewhere around uh, March time frame because we are actually doing the programming. Right. And those guys who are actually interested to try out the module, just uh, give me a link up. Then, uh, you know, I would send you the, 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 the
the basic rules of business haven't changed for 10,000 years. If you want to suffer your, uh, you know, a, a very low yield rate, yeah, do your stuff and launch it without any basic planning. Yes, research is fundamental. Right? You you need to find out if the data points aren't there, make an assumption. But you, you can't just assume that the world of business has changed because the internet has come around. I would rather go to the extent and say that don't just figure out who is all are offering similar product, but go to an extent and see who all can offer similar products. Because if you are not able to see that thing coming in, I mean, we see, I mean, there are ample number of examples available where large companies themselves, they have gone down the drain. And we are not talking about whether they will survive or not uh, for next two, three years. So, yeah, you need to go to that extent and um, figure out who can be potential. It's like the internal mantra that only the paradox survive. Okay, <laughs> I agree. I said yes. Um, and um, this your other question. I'm sorry. Your third question, which you answered, in terms of uh, um, I'm honestly not here in Mokinti capacity, not here at all, because uh, you know it's not relevant in the Mokinti capacity. I'm here in a personal capacity because uh, what you find is a lot of uh, uh, consultants like myself, a lot of bankers, a lot of. Uh, Maybe I'm sure. Uh, <clears throat> investing in, in, in companies like you know startups and have you, and I find that to be a very cheap way to get access to uh, advisory services for companies, strategic investors, um, and and so uh, a lot of the things I do as a hobby outside McKinsey is in and around uh, um, uh, providing free advice to companies I've invested in, and uh, a lot of people do this, right? So I mean. We're looking for kind of avenues to get access to this kind of thing. It's a great avenue. And Cradle, yeah, Cradle, right? Uh, you look there just now, sorry. So, Cradle, for example. Uh, uh, she looks like she's got money to give away. Facilitates a lot of this, right? So, it's, uh, it's one option. Do you yourself, uh, uh, Karen, do you and, and, and Nimal, you know, did you guys uh, uh, give mentorship also if somebody wants to? You know, comes in a bit blur and ask for advice or, you know, spend some time with them. Do you all do that? If I'm invested in it, yes. If you're invested <laughs> So you invest yourself also then? Uh, oh. You do? Oh, cool. Uh, Karen? Yeah, yeah. You yeah, would, you, huh? you don't mind the blur comments, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just said it's not Most importantly. Most importantly. Okay, yeah. sorry, I, I, I just left. Uh, brother, you want to ask a question? No, no, I just wanted to give an answer regarding augmented reality. Oh, okay. Uh, we know augmented reality apps, our company itself, we've been doing it for a few years. Oh, okay. And uh, one of the keys we've experimented on everything, and probably you say why it will take off or not take off, is that key basic for a layman's term, a technical person, but for a layman's term, you have something called a marker, you've got the engine, then you've got the animation, right? So when you develop apps for augmented reality, it depends on what kind of engine you're using, all right? Whether you're paying license for that, how big the engine is, whether you can squeeze it into your app. Now, so it comes into the uh, model, right? Uh, not a lot of people understand that how you can squeeze a 3D CAD CAM drawing into an app. So that plays a major role. A lot of people don't do this right is because they try and squeeze a building that was done on a CAD CAM by a 3D engineer into a mobile app, and that's probably 500 MB for him to download and for that app to actually run on your phone. So the failure for these augmented reality uh, for not picking up is actually in the development process in understanding how the technology works. Network, you need a strong network, internet capability to be able to pull these animation of things that are spot here. Right? So for now to today, what we do for our clients is we do proof of concept stuff, you know, that they can showcase at an event, that they can showcase whether it's a 3D modeling for a building that's coming out or walk-in 3D modeling or that. For people to actually consume augmented reality today uh, for it to take off, uh, it has still a long way to go because of networks. We, we need very good networks. You need to understand what kind of engine you're using, whether you're paying license for it or whether it's a Qualcomm fantastic engine, right, uh, to develop this app, and also what kind of marker you're using, whether, you know, even a simple picture of a BMW car, that can be a megapixel, you know, so how do you understand that? So, augmented reality from proof of concept, it can be done fantastically, provided you understand what kind of technology you're using, what's behind it, and how you squeeze something that's 300 MB to 30 MB, you know, what you're going to use up, what you're willing to cannibalize, and what you're willing to give experience to the user. So in terms of that, it is a fantastic to see, and we are actually at the peak 
but it's still a long way to go because of factors that are involved. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's actually a very interesting uh, few years that's going to come up from it. Is it? Okay, good man. I know uh, DNA at some point has to incorporate that also uh, into what, the work that we do. <laughs> no? Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, just trying to sound sexy. Only for my speeches. <laughs> <laughs> Only for my speeches. Okay, guys. Uh, uh, thanks very much for your time. I'd like us to just thank the families, right? In the traditional Asian way. Uh, and please, all of you, right, uh, meet somebody you haven't met before and just form some new networks and relationships, right, when you when you leave this room tonight, okay? Please. Thanks a lot and see you at next month's this month. Sorry?